good morning. It is so good to see you today. Glad that you're here with us on this Labor Day weekend, and we want to welcome those of you who are worshiping online with us. Glad that you're here as well. I hope that you're getting to spend some time with family and maybe friends, and also taking time throughout the weekend to thank God for the gifts and the talents that he's given you with which you make a living and support your family. Well, as Seth said a few moments ago, today we're introducing a new series of messages called Into the Wilderness. And the reason for the series name is God was going to take his people on a journey, a journey into the wilderness that would require a whole lot of things, deep faith, courage, stamina, trust, and of course the willingness to part with that which with they were familiar. Y'all, this was not going to be easy. There were gonna be a tremendous number of challenges and obstacles to overcome. We're gonna be spending our time in the book of Exodus, so if you wanna go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, of course, all of our scripture will be on the screens here on the stage. Well, Exodus is a part of what's called the Pentateuch, and the other books in the Pentateuch are Genesis, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. As with those four books of the Bible, Moses is its author. Now, as you know, some of the most dramatic scenes that are found in all of Scripture are found in the pages of Exodus. In it, we find God speaking to Moses from the burning bush, the ten plagues being set in motion, Israel's actual exodus leaving Egypt. They're crossing the Red Sea on dry land and then God giving them the law in chapter 20 at Mount Sinai. Well, let's get right into the first chapter, verse number one. It says, these were the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, in many ways, the book of Exodus is simply a continuation of Genesis because it picks up where Genesis ends. And the phrase that references Joseph here is very significant. He's introduced into the biblical narrative way back in Genesis chapter 37. Born to his father, Jacob, in Jacob's old age, he quickly became his dad's favorite. As you can imagine, this didn't sit very well with all of his brothers. And they grew to despise him so badly that they actually sold him into slavery. Eventually, Joseph wound up a servant of Potiphar, who was a high-ranking official in, Egyptians, in the Egyptian pharaoh's service. Well, after being put in charge of Potiphar's household, Joseph was falsely accused of making unwanted advances toward Potiphar's wife. He was thrown into prison. And while there, God gave him the miraculous ability to interpret dreams. And in time, he was asked to actually interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. He did so accurately. He told the king that seven years of abundance would be followed by seven years of famine. And after offering counsel on how to handle that coming adversity, Joseph was put in charge of the food distribution. It was appointed second in command only to the Pharaoh. Now this famine that Joseph predicted did indeed happen and it affected not only the residents of Egypt but the surrounding countries as well. So when food got scarce, Jacob sent his sons to buy grain from the Egyptians. Now several years later, they had no idea what had happened to their brother Joseph. And they had no idea that they would come face to face with him in purchasing grain to feed their families. When they did, it goes without saying, the things got very tense. If you're familiar with the story, you know that Joseph was able to keep his identity hidden from them. But in a short amount of time, he revealed who he was. And yet rather than punish his brothers for selling him into slavery, the awful way they treated him he forgave them. Here's what he said, Genesis 45, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. 
For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Well, throughout all of his trials and endeavors, God was with Joseph because he had dedicated himself to the Lord. And he blessed not only him, but those that he worked for and came into contact with. You see, God had used Joseph's travails as well as his leadership skills to save the Israelite people from starvation and preserve their ancestry. Well, back to Exodus 1, verse 6. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. So all of Jacob's sons who had originally come to Egypt to get food and Joseph got older and they passed away. And yet their families had remained, they grew and they expanded. And whereas once their presence was welcomed, oh (laughs) y'all, things had changed. Then a new king, verse eight, who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Joseph had been this well-respected and admired leader, and not just among the people of his own, his Israelites, but the Egyptians as well. And since this new king claimed to have no recognition whatsoever of Joseph and his great influence, that was no longer the case. So he says, look to his people. The Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. Now history tells us that the population of the Israelites had not gotten so large that the Egyptians were unable to contain them. The king was embellishing his fear And there's a good chance that he exaggerated it on purpose to get the attention of his own people and then to curry their favor in what he was about to do next. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Because of his desire to oppress the Israelites, the king instructed the slave masters to essentially make their lives miserable to wear them down. And by doing so, the Pharaoh thought that he could hold down any chance of rebellion and then also exhaust them to the point that their numbers were kept in check. But was he wrong? (laughs) Verse 12, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with labor and brick and mortar, with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. When this attempt to control his subjects, the the Pharaoh failed miserably. Y'all, he'd convinced himself that his plan was brilliant. It was foolproof. He thought he could pull this off with no problem. But what he didn't realize was in opposing the Israelites, he was opposing God himself. You see, the people that he was holding captive weren't his real enemy. His real enemy was God. The first thing we learn from this story that's there on your outline is when we fight God, it never ends well. Pharaoh was ambitious. He was determined but he didn't stand a chance of successfully defying God. You see, God was going to lead his people out of bondage and into the wilderness to the land that he had promised them, and it didn't matter who tried to stop him. Now, nations far and wide feared the king of Egypt and his military might, but he couldn't hope to fight God and come out on top. He was headstrong, and because of it, he and his people were later really put through the ringer by the Lord. Y'all, I've seen this too many times to count, and perhaps you have too. 
folks absolutely bent on their own way and going after it no matter the cost to themselves or their family. In the beginning, they had no way to envision the suffering that they would put themselves through just to get what they wanted. The price can be very, very steep. Back in the 1980s and 90s, Rich Mullins was one of contemporary Christians' most well-known songwriters and musicians, kind of like the Chris Tomlin of today. In his song, Hold Me Jesus, he admitted to this very struggle with God. He said, surrender don't come natural, natural to me. I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than take what you give that I need. And I beat my head against so many walls. What was he admitting? Well, I'm fighting God and I might as well beat my head against a wall because God is that immovable. He's not going anywhere. The Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was doing this very thing and he was learning the hard way. If you read on into the pages of Exodus, you know that he endured 10 plagues which God unleashed upon he and his people and it devastated the land. And this was done so the king would soften his heart and let the Israelites go. While being bombarded by those plagues, though, he still refused to be reasoned with. Now, in the end, he finally did relent and set God's people free, only to change his mind, remember, and pursue them to the Red Sea and then see his entire army drown there. Y'all, if we're fighting God, we cannot possibly think that we'll win this battle. Some of us might be fighting God over the control of our very lives. We want to be in charge, but he says no, because it's not in our best interest. He's pursuing you, and you're well aware of it. Maybe he's been knocking on your heart's door for a long, long time but for whatever reason, you're reluctant to give yourself to him. So you keep trying to put distance between the two of you. You hold him at arm's length. Now, Jesus loves you and he wants to come into your life so that you can be at peace with him. Sometimes believer in, believers in Jesus even fight God. Some of us might be fighting him over the changes that he's insisting that we make. Maybe it's a sinful habit that doesn't reflect well on him. The Bible tells us we can actually resist the Holy Spirit and grieve him when he's trying to lead us in a direction that we're sometimes hesitant to go. Well, instead of fighting God, we need to stand with God. The second thing that we learn from this story is when we stand with God, it leads to certain blessings. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. When this edict was given, this order was issued. It was binding. You see, in antiquity, antiquity when a tyrant or a dictator like the Pharaoh spoke, it was law. There was no such thing as negotiating over a direct order. It was do it or suffer the consequences. But notice the actions of these ladies. Regardless of the threat, they chose to stand with God. Y'all, we never go wrong when we hear and obey God's voice. Although the Egyptian king was the ultimate earthly authority, these midwives knew a higher authority, one superior to him. And they not only did the right thing, but had a noble reason for doing so. Look there, 
They feared God. Now this wasn't a cowering fear, but one of reverence. You see, their desire was to obey and please him, not someone who made unreasonable and even wicked demands. We have a term today for what these women did. It's called civil disobedience. According to the Bible, we're to follow the laws of our land until or unless those laws violate or contradict God's word. So whether it's the president or our state governor or the local police, the Bible reminds us that we're to do what they say. Here's how it reads, Romans 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. This was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome. In some instances, believers were treated terribly simply because they believed in Jesus. So their initial response, their reaction was to revolt. It was to, to say, I'm not doing what you say. But Paul let them know it was their duties as disciples of Christ to obey the law, provided it was being applied properly. And yet when situations like this arise, these women were being asked to take the lives of innocent human beings. They had to disobey. Now, there are a lot of examples of people in Scripture who practiced civil disobedience. They chose to stand with God rather than give in to those who were trying to force them to compromise their faith. Perhaps you've heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young men were living in Jerusalem when King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon attacked and overran that great city. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken captive, but eventually they were given positions of authority in the Babylonian government. In time, King Nebuchadnezzar set up a 90-foot-tall gold statue and instructed all the people in the land to bow down to it and to worship it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Israelites, and they worshiped the one true God. So they refused to observe the king's order. The king wasn't happy about that, needless to say. Their unwillingness to comply meant that they would die in a fiery furnace. And yet when they were brought before the king to give account for their stance, here's what they said. Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, if you read on into the story, you'll see that God did indeed bless them by rescuing them from the furnace. But I want you to note the courage of these men who stood with God, even though God gave them no guarantee that they would live through such a trying ordeal. Y'all, all they knew was if they compromised with evil, it would be disastrous. Now, right now, we're not being pressured by any form of government to do anything against our will. So civil disobedience might not be on our radar. One day it could be. What's more realistic for the majority of us is needing to stand up to and refuse to blindly follow the world. The world demands our absolute loyalty. It's all about money, power, success, and making a name for yourselves. You see, it tells us to look out for nobody but number one. And if you subscribe to its philosophies, it tolerates no dissent. If you, if you get on board with its views and toe the line, you'll be fine. But if at some point you offer a different view, look out. They'll come after you. 
they'll destroy you. We all know that the woke cancel culture holds sway over the lives of way too many people. God says the alternative is to believe in him, to side with him and live according to his ways. And he'll bless you. Something else that's a real possibility for believers in Jesus to have to deal with is an employer who might pressure you to do something dishonest or unethical. In a message I shared with you a couple of years ago, two years ago spring, on family dedication day, I mentioned a good friend in ministry that this happened to. At that time, he'd been a staff member with this particular church for over 30 years. And although the church itself had remained very conservative, the denomination had steered way, way far away from the teachings of the Bible. So when new leadership took over at my friend's church, paperwork was placed before him. He was given an ultimatum. He would either sign it or be terminated. Or rather than go along with their demand, he resigned. When he walked out of that building that day, gone was his job. The security that he'd known for over 30 years and of course a steady paycheck. Here's the update. Several people who disagreed with the church's decision came to him and asked him to start a new church. Since he maintained his integrity, they wanted to be a part of what he was leading. I stay in touch with him periodically by text. In December of last year, I asked how he and the church were doing. He said, the church is going really well. It looks like we might be getting a church building in the next month. We can't afford it, but God can. <laughs> in May, I inquired about those things again. And he replied, things are great. Church has been wonderful. We got a building and numbers are up. People are excited about Jesus. Last week, I posed the same question. He said, things are still going great. I don't understand this. God is really blessing us here. I told him that the Lord's blessing on his work wasn't hard to figure out. You see, when he stood with God, God in turn stood with him. Y'all, you know this, the pressure to conform to others' expectations of us can be unrelenting. And sometimes it can even come from those that are the closest to us. Relatives and friends that might want to intervene and kind of run our life, you know, call the shots for us. And if we don't go along, they can really put the squeeze on if we don't go along with their suggestions, sometimes they'll even resort to drastic tactics, you know, to get us to come around. What these midwives faced was certain death because they went against the command of the Pharaoh. But I want you to look what happened as a result of their bold stand for God. Verse 20, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Because they were so steadfast in their devotion to God, he threw open the floodgates of heaven and y'all rained down blessing upon blessing. This is what God promises to every person who chooses to follow him and stand with him no matter the cost. Now, none of us can say what form those blessings will take when we hang on to Jesus in those tough moments. For these midwives, it was very tangible. They got husbands. <laughs> they got children. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was the very presence of God in, in that furnace. He delivered them from the flames so that their lives were extended. For you, the blessing might come a little more than the satisfaction of knowing that you stayed true to God in the face of mounting pressure and intimidation. You did the right thing and through it, God was honored.
Now, what makes this story, this part of the Bible's narrative so important? Well, when the midwives stood up to the Pharaoh, their actions had far-reaching ramifications that they didn't know anything about at that time. You see, a little bit later in Exodus, God's people were delivered from Egyptian slavery and sent into the wilderness toward the land that God had promised. And because so many male babies were spared from death, the Israelites began their journey, a very strong people. And this was vital because centuries later, the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, would come through their bloodline to save the world. You see, he gave his life on the cross for every man, woman, boy and girl. So in a very real way, the Israelite midwives contributed to the coming of the Savior. He gave his life so that we could know spiritual freedom. The Israelites knew physical freedom being delivered. We need spiritual freedom, don't we? Now, there's nothing like being liberated from the bondage of your past. If before today you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, he awaits your decision to follow him. Well, just before closing, I want to share with you a couple of action points that I hope will help in you taking a stand with God. The first is when we stand with him, it strengthens us. You know, we see this happen in the lives of the apostles. The last couple of weeks, Griffin was going through those early chapters of the book of Acts. And they're preaching and they're simply standing up. Even when threatened not to speak in Jesus' name, they did what he had commissioned them to do without any fear of reprisal. And it appeared every time they did, they got more courageous. I want to assure you, even if you're not used to doing this, that every time you do, you'll become more bold, more daring. We don't have to be mean. We don't have to come across as a know-it-all. We just have to be firm on what we believe in this politically correct world. Our goal was not to offend anybody, unnecessarily but it's to boldly proclaim God's truth unashamedly and unreservedly. The second action point is this, when we stand with God, it will inspire others to do the same. Y'all, a fearless spokesman for Jesus is a mighty tool in his arsenal. When growing up, my best friend in the world lived next door. His name was Mickey. Mickey. And we were young teenagers, long before I had any thoughts of a relationship with God, he became a Christian. At that time, we were traveling in very different circles. And since I wasn't connected to any church, Mick would invite me to youth outings and socials, different things that went on at his church. And when I would get around those people, I'd wonder how they did what they did. What made them tick? <laughs> Why didn't they just do what everybody else was doing? Y'all, they were so different. And that made an indelible impression on me. Down deep inside, I wanted what they had with Jesus. Now, it'd be several years before I became a Christian, but part of the reason I did was I saw over and over again how my dear friend took a stand for God. Believe me when I tell you there are people looking for a godly example to follow. And you can inspire them to do as you have done. Well, if our prayer partners will go ahead and come forward at this time, we're getting ready to close in prayer. These folks will be down front for you to be able to, to pray with you about anything that's going on. Let me just leave you with this before we pray. When we fear God, we don't have to fear anybody else. <laughs> what they think, what they will say about us, even how they'll treat us, 
as has been said by so many people in the past, we perform for an audience of one. You see, it's really only he that we're here to please. So would you stand with God? Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for demonstrating that in and through your son, Jesus. Lord, we want to be brave as the people that we've read about in scripture today, these Israelite midwives, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my friend. God, help us to know that when we take a stand for you, that you will empower us to do exactly that time after time after time. And when we stand for you, God, you'll bless us. You have a way of taking care of us and looking after us that nobody else has. So God, today we want to leave with that thought, knowing when we're obedient to you that you're right there in the midst of it. So thank you for those wonderful promises and thank you for the time that we've had together worshiping this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.